Good evening. Welcome to worship. It's New Testament study night. We begin a new book tonight. We finished up 1st and 2nd Corinthians. Now we move on to the Gospel of Luke. And there's about 80 verses in this first chapter, so we're going to cut it into two weeks at least here. And we'll get started here. Luke was Paul's protege. And let's just jump right into your chapter 1, verse 1. For as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us, even as they deliver them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. Now remember the form of letter back then is who it's from, who it's to. So here it's, he says, first of all, the reason he's writing, Luke says, because there's a lot of people, many, he said, have taken in hand to, uh, to write about the things which we believe. Remember, we just finished studying Corinthians, and have you ever thought uh, the Corinthian church in the Bible and the other churches too in the Bible that Paul wrote to, they didn't have a New Testament. It was still being written in letters and things that they didn't consider it Bible at the time until the centuries went by and things were canonized. But uh, Luke says a lot of people are writing stuff down. He says, so I'm going to write something down too, the things that we believe, because he said, I've got them, verse 2, I've got them from them people who were eyewitnesses from the very beginning. He knew the apostles. He had traveled with Paul, we find out in the book of Acts. Ministers of the word he'd gotten them from. Verse 3. So it seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus. Now, Luke writes two books in the New Testament. He writes the Gospel according to Luke, and he's also the author of the book of Acts. Acts is the sequel to Luke. And you'll notice in both of them, Luke writes to somebody by the name of Theophilus. It could have been a certain person by that name, but most likely it's a literary device. Theophilus in the Greek means lover of God. So if, if it's just a literary device, or both, Luke is writing to those people who love God, most excellent Theophiluses, that thou mightest know the certainty of those things wherein thou hast been instructed. Now we get to the beginning of the body of the letter. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias. He was of the course or of the line of Abia, and his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. So we meet these first two characters he brings onto the pages named Zacharias and Elizabeth. Now, if you've been studying your Bible all your life, you already know we're meeting here the mother and father of John the Baptist, John and Elizabeth, or excuse me, Zacharias and Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord blameless. And they were righteous before God because the Bible always talks about a righteousness by faith. They believed God, just like Abraham believed God and it was counted for righteousness. We believe the gospel and it's counted for our righteousness. We have the imputed righteousness of Christ by faith. We believe the message of the cross. And because we believe that, we're counted righteous or counted blameless even. Apart from the cross, none of us are blameless, but by grace through faith, Christians are blameless, forgiven. And they had no child, Elizabeth and Zacharias, because Elizabeth was barren, and they were both now well stricken in years. They were getting older, and it came to pass that while Zacharias executed the priest's office before God in the, in the order of his course, or when it was his time to do his shift. Remember, they were operating in the in the temple at all times and had lots of different priests. So when it, his, his lot come up, his number came, he had to go and work for a week or so and offer the sacrifice. Except this time, it was his time to be the one that burned the incense. Chapter or verse 9. According to the custom of the priest office, his lot was to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. So he's went through all the rituals and the sacrifices. He's able to go into the temple himself, and he goes in there to burn the incense. And verse 10, the whole people, the congregation, the whole multitude of the people, they were praying outside at the time of the incense. And here's, here's a picture for you of the New Testament church. This is the Old Testament church really still meeting, 
We haven't gotten to John the Baptist, let alone the birth of Christ yet, but uh, while the priest is in there offering the sacrifices before the Lord, the people assemble together corporately out there to pray and to worship. Now, they weren't living in a time of pandemics. That's why they weren't watching on Facebook. They would assemble together to be in that congregation, that assembly. And that's what we're called to do, too. There's something, I mean, it's one thing to be able to watch on TV or the Facebook, but there's something about we need that to assemble together and worship with one another in that corporate worship. That's what the people were doing. They were out there praying while the, while the sacrifice and the incense was going on in the temple. That's worship. And there appeared unto him, when Zechariah is in there doing his thing, lighting the incense, he had a vision. Uh, there appeared unto him, maybe it's not even a vision, maybe it's just a, maybe we should say it's just a literal thing that happened here. There appeared unto him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zechariah saw him, he was troubled and fear fell upon him. Now, wouldn't the same thing happen if you, you looked up and just going about your business and routine and, and there stands the angel of the Lord. You would have been a little bit troubled and feared too, wouldn't you? Fear fell upon him. But the angel said unto him, fear not. And when you study through the Bible, whether it's the Old Testament or the New Testament, it seems like in most every case when somebody encounters an angel, the first words out of the angel's mouth is, fear not. Even the Christmas angels, you know, fear not, for I bring you good tidings of great joy. You know why the angel said fear not? That tells me that, man, it must be an awesome thing to see one of God's angels. Not one of those cute and cuddly little things that makes you want to quake and tremble. It says, fear not, Zacharias, for your prayer is heard. Now, I've got good news for you. The angel said, you've been praying. God's heard your prayer. And your wife, what's he praying for? I guess it's right here. Well, the, your wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son. And you'll call his name John. This is John the Baptist, how we know him as here now. So remember in that day, for a woman not to have a child, it was a big reproach upon her. That was the big deal, to, to uh, have children. And she wasn't able to. So Zechariah knew she is, they was both getting old, so he's still praying for God to give him a child. And Maybe specifically in this case, a son. He says, your prayer's been heard, and you're going to have a son. You're going to call him John. And just like little babies coming into homes today, he'll bring joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. Now, I don't believe that was all old Zacharias was praying for, just give me a son here. I think he was praying more specific things than God had heard his prayer. For he'll be great in the sight of the Lord. Don't you reckon Zechariah was praying that too? That I don't just want a child, but I want that child to be great in the sight of the Lord. That'd be a good prayer for people to pray today, getting ready to have a baby. May they grow up and be great in the sight of the Lord. <laughs> this might not be a bad prayer for them to pray either. That they'll neither drink wine nor strong drink, because nobody wants to bring a drunk into the world. But in this case... It's applying specifically to John the Baptist that we're going to find out that he was a, a Nazarite from his mother's womb. Remember, they had special power with God. They could never touch the fruit of the vine or anything. And he'll be filled with the Holy Ghost. Maybe Zechariah's been praying that for him already, even when he wasn't even conceived yet. Even from his mother's womb. And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God. Ain't that a good prayer for a, a daddy and a mama to pray for their, their son? That uh, Maybe that's what he's saying, I, that he'll be great in the eyes of God and that he'll cause other people to turn to God. And he shall go before him. Now the he in this is John the Baptist, this baby that's been talked about right now. And the him is the Messiah, Jesus. John will go before Jesus in the spirit and the power of Elijah. That was how the Old Testament ended in Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament, that Elijah would come back before the coming of the Messiah. So he wasn't going to be reincarnated, but this Jesus talks about this later on in this gospel, that Elijah came back in spirit and power through the person of John the Baptist. And he'll turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And that's, that's what the New Testament church is too. You know, uh, back in Amos, when God was about to bring judgment upon Israel, who was God's people of the Old Testament, Amos told them, said, prepare to meet thy God. 
we get over in the New Testament, John chapter 14, and Jesus says, uh, I'm going to prepare a place for you that where I am, you'll be also. So from those two verses, we can say, you know what? Heaven is a prepared place for a prepared people. And that's what John the Baptist is doing. He's preparing people to meet Jesus here, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And Zechariah said to the angel now, Whereby shall I know this? Or how, how can I know that he's asking for a sign? Now, the angel of the Lord is standing right there, done scared him to death and talking to him. And dear old Zechariah, he uh, said, Can you give me a sign that I can really believe this? And the angel says, uh, I'm going to give you a sign, and you ain't going to like it. Hold that thought here. Whereby shall I know this? For I'm an old man, and my wife's well stricken in years. There'll be a miracle birth for them too, I guess. Like many of the Old Testament patriarchs who were ancient and old when they had children. And the angel answering said unto him, I'm Gabriel that stands in the presence of God, and I'm sent to speak unto thee and to show thee these glad tidings or this good news. And behold, thou shalt be dumb and not able to speak. <laughs> There's your sign. Because you didn't take me at, at the, or worse, the angel could put it this way, because you didn't take God at his word. That's what the angel was giving him, was God's word. And you asked for some dumb sign, said, uh, well, you're going to be dumb. And you won't be able to talk either. <laughs> You'll be dumb and not able to speak. Until the day that these things shall be performed. Because thou believest not my words, you doubted me, which shall be fulfilled in their season. And the people, they were outside, remember the prayer meeting, while well, the priest was inside, so it's time for Zechariah to come out, and he had never come out. So the people waited for Zechariah, and they marveled that he tarried so long in the temple. <laughs> people started saying, what's he doing in their old days? Past 12 o'clock, dinner's burning, I should be going home to the beans, right? <laughs> and when he came out, he couldn't speak unto them. And they perceived that he had seen a vision in the temple. For he beckoned unto them, or he made gestures, <laughs> trying to tell. Now, I got to think about that and kind of chuckled. You know, it's like old Zechariah, he comes out and then, uh, you try it sometime, place your rage with somebody and say, uh, try to tell them that you just saw an angel <laughs> by the altar and see how it works out for you. But he beckoned to them and they knew he'd seen a vision, but he couldn't talk. He remained speechless. And it came to pass that as soon as the days of his ministration were accomplished, his shift was over. He worked a certain amount of days as some other priest to come in for a while. And then he departed to his own house. And after those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived. And she didn't tell anybody for five months. She hid herself five months saying, Thus hath the Lord dealt with me in the days wherein he looked on me, and he's taken away my reproach from among men. Says all the other women and they were looking down on me and everything, but said, now the Lord's taken away my reproach. I'm going to have a child too. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin, a spouse to a name, man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. So now we meet Mary and Joseph. You know who these folks are. And the Bible says here that they were already engaged. They were espoused. Now, back in this day, engagement was a little bit different than today. Today, you know, you can be engaged to somebody and decide you won't get married and you just give them the ring back and say it ain't going to work out. But back in that day, the engagement was really a step of the marriage itself. The marriage hadn't been consummated until after the wedding, but uh, it was almost like legally binding. And so he goes to Mary, who's engaged to Joseph, and Joseph is a descendant of King David, and that virgin's name was Mary. That's important. Remember, the Messiah had to come through the line of David and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And the angel came in to her and said, Hail thou that are highly favored, the Lord's with thee, blessed art thou among women. And when she, Mary, saw it, she was troubled at this saying, and she cast in her mind what manner of, of greeting this should be. And the angel said to her, Fear not, see? <laughs> Fear not, Mary. Don't be afraid, for you've found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son, and you'll call his name Jesus. Which means you'll save his people, Savior. He shall be great, 
and he'll be called the son of the highest. And the Lord will give unto him the throne of his father David. And he'll reign over the house of Jacob forever. Now, how do you have a king that lives or reigns forever? Because kings, we had so many in the Old Testament because they, he only lived so long and he died. This is going to be an eternal king. And of his kingdom, there'll be no end. Then said Mary to the angel, How shall this be? Seeing I know not a man. I've never been with a man. How can I be pregnant? Good question, right? It's only happened to one person ever. And by the way, sometimes you hear somebody say back in Isaiah's prophecy that a virgin will conceive and give birth. They say, well, virgin in the Hebrew can mean a young woman. That is true. But you can argue what virgin means in the Greek. I think it's the way we interpret it in the Greek. But let's just argue it in the English here about the virgin birth. The Bible says, I've never known a man. That's pretty clear, ain't it? Verse 34, how should this be? He said, I know not a man. She was astounded. How's that possible? And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost will come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which will be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And behold, your cousin Elizabeth, so Mary, the mother of Jesus, and Elizabeth, the Mary of John, uh, the mother of John the Baptist, were cousins. We find out here, living in different towns. Behold, your cousin Elizabeth; she also conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month with her. I think he's three, three months or, or six months ahead of Jesus here. Who was she, she was called barren. He's answering the question the angel is that Mary asks, how can this be? Here's the answer. For with God, nothing will be impossible. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. And Mary said, behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. It sounded like her faith was a little bit better than Zechariah's, so she didn't get struck dumb for a while. And then the angel departed from her. That's a good stopping point, so we'll pick up here next Wednesday night. So we've had the uh, announcement to the parents of John the Baptist and the amount, announcement to Mary that both of them are going to conceive and bring forth children whom we'll find out John the Baptist and our Lord Jesus. See you next week.